Welcome to a special edition of The Point with me, Lu Xin. CGTN has done a special series called The China Footprint that covers 15 topics on a daily basis. This series shows what China has achieved in just a few decades. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by four people who have gone out uh, to different parts of China to make these stories and who have come back with stories to share what they have seen, how they felt, who they met, and what they have learned. So let me introduce them to you. They are my colleagues, Jeff Moody, Zhou Yun, Tao Yuan, and Jonathan Betts. Welcome to all of you. First of all, um, why are we doing this series? Why is the China footprint so important that all of us are going out to do a story or two about it? Jeff? There's always a good moment to tell these China stories, but having us tell them, I think, is really interesting. I, mean, I don't know what Jonathan's experiences have been, but for me, mm -hmm. what I had to do was looking at... I, I was told to tell the story of the Chinese government and how it's formed wow. in an entertaining, witty way in wow. two and a half minutes. Try doing that in two <laughs> and a half minutes. Did you have right. a choice, or you, you said, <laughs> I want to do that? Um, a bit of both. <laughs> I was <laughs> suggested that might be a good one for me, mm. but I was quite, I was quite pleased to do it. Mm. But I think certainly from our point of view, it's really interesting having having Westerners trying to tell a China story. Yeah. It brings a whole sort of new dimension sure, to it. Sure, sure. What about the ladies? Well, I think now because uh, China is at a crucial stage where the world is has is having a very strong curiosity about China, or sometimes it's even criticism and doubts. For instance, um, this year actually marks um, the 16th year after China joins WTO. And starting from last year, we're seeing this anti-globalization trend. We're seeing so many doubts from the Western world about China being the free rider of globalization. That's why my story focuses on China's lesson, that the lesson that China has learned after its WTO accession on whether China is the free rider uh, of globalization. So I think that's an important lesson for not only China, but also the rest of the world to think about and to explore. So basically, we have to address some of the doubts and maybe accusations against China uh, you know, inter, uh, along the way of China's development. Tao Yuan, what, uh, what was your mission, let's say, <laughs> and uh, how did you find it? Well, I, I did a story about poverty alleviation in, in China's villages. It's not just about this story that I covered for this time. I'm based in southwest China, which is a relatively underdeveloped region of the country. When you talk about China, you always think about the skyscrapers, the, the, the traffic, the smog, the economy. Seldom do you think that there are still places like that in China, very backward places. We've covered places about, uh, we've covered places where, where children can't even go to school because their village is too remote and they don't have a teacher. Um, we've, we've been to places where you can't even build roads there because mm -hmm. the terrain is too harsh. Seldom do people think, do people know that there are still this kind of places in China. In fact, half of the population in China are still rural population. Yeah. People keep forgetting that there are these pockets of poverty right. in different parts of because China. Because it's developing so fast. Yeah, right. you tend to l only look at the bright side. Right. And but I, think, I think it's interesting what you were saying about how um, you, you spend your whole life going to places. Mm. Because my experience is totally different. And Jonathan <laughs> is probably the same. Sitting I spend my whole studio. life going to the studio. Okay, my home in Beijing to the studio. Yeah. Yeah. Back again, well, so. that's, w that's why it's a nice change, right, Jonathan? Right. For you, who, yeah. who are very new to CGTN. Very new. I've only been in China for three months now. This oh. is, I think, my three month anniversary today. And wow. so it's been Happy quite an experience. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to be here. A toast. Uh, truly, and, and I can't think of a better way to spend it than right now. But uh, what I like about these stories in the series is that China, I think, is so misunderstood within China and I think outside China, especially outside China and especially in the United States. So I really was looking forward to this opportunity to go out into the country, talk with people, meet people from all kinds of different backgrounds and all different professions, and learn more about what makes this huge, dynamic, powerful country tick. <laughs> what did you do? Where did you so go? my focus was on the technology, uh -huh. which as an American is extremely interesting to me because China has something that the United States does not have, which is a thriving, large, efficient transportation network, especially when it comes to its trains. America badly needs high-speed bullet trains we do not have. Within 10 years, 10 years, China has built the world's largest and fastest high-speed rail network. So you did went to see the trains, you had a test ride on some of the uh, modules, and you came back with uh, some very interesting stuff. Why don't we take a look at this short uh, clip together? 
Here at Skatong University, they've got this pretty sophisticated piece of machinery. It's a computer simulation they use for all of their train engineers to train them how to drive the high-speed bullet trains. And I get to take it for a spin. So pushing in, and slowly, there we go, okay. All right, here we go. And they throw things at you like storms, which is kind of cool. So I got to turn on the windshield wipers and the lights. So I, I guess fun. that, yeah, it's that fun. must have <laughs> looked like fun. We're it not looked jealous like at all. Fun. We're not jealous at all. <laughs> no, I'm very jealous. <laughs> it looked like a huge video game. It was pretty much like a huge video game for me. You couldn't pull me out of it. I had so <laughs> much fun in there. I mean, it was, it was a more complicated, more difficult than I thought because Why? it is the exact same route between, as I mentioned, between Tianjin and Beijing. Mm. And I thought it'd be driving like a car, but it's nothing like that. The brakes, the accelerator are all different, and it's clearly a job that you have to have a lot of focus for and a lot of, um, and a clear attention span, mm -hmm. frankly. And it tests you, as I mentioned, there are all kinds of conditions with the rain, sandstorms, you name it, other trains coming yeah. at you. It was really interesting, and it, it honestly raised my respect for the people who do those jobs. Mm. It's clearly a very difficult, taxing mm. job. Wow, it's it's great that uh, that you have such you know respect and such a great feeling about um, these people who are working very hard. But again, looking back, um, looking back to your own country, for instance, there mm -hmm. are still a lot of people who are. I don't know, how do people perceive China's high-speed railway and China's huge capability and appetite for infrastructure development, right? China is like this great builder wherever mm -hmm. you go <laughs> overnight, the roads are there, the airports are there. What do you think China can share with the rest of the world with this capability and the technology? Uh, what I think is most remarkable about it is just the sheer fact that it can be done. Really almost the inspiration, I think, is what is most valuable here at least in the United States, and maybe you can talk about Europe as well, it, the idea that you could build a bullet train within 10 years, not to mention the, a huge bullet train network, I think would just astound most Americans. It's just impossible. It can't be done. There's too much bureaucracy, too much red tape. Well, China somehow gets it done, mm -hmm. and, they get, and it, they get it done well. So if China can do it, then s why can't America do it? Why can America do it? That is the question everybody is asking. That is asking. the question. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah? So, yeah. Far, so far we haven't. Hmm. And you look at me, I came from New York. I lived in New York for four years. Uh, right now, New Yorkers are suffering with a very difficult transportation network. The subways do not work well or reliably. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's very awful. inconvenient. And that's a tough, tough challenge for, you know, the country's largest city when you want to have an efficient workforce that can move around easily, and it's not easy to do. Mm. Jeff, what is the European, what is the London perspective? Oh, good Lord. The transport system in, in Britain as a whole is atrocious at the moment. We, we're plagued by strikes. I mean, when I left, there were, from, from my hometown, Brighton, to where I worked in London, you would get two or three trains a day if you're lucky because there was a huge strike that took over the whole of the south of England that went, had been going on for something like, this was huge, and it just ground the whole network. It, 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 you just couldn't really do anything. Mm. And I, I think Britain is very, can get quite crippled with things like that. Because it's, it's, obviously it's about having the money and having the wherewithal, but, it, but it's having the, the get up and go to do it. You have to want to do it. And Britain China very much at the moment wants to do these things, yes, doesn't it? Yes, The other three stories, which one is, had, the, had the greatest difficulty? Tell me. I don't know. <laughs> I imagine it's the government one, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> As a Chinese, I cannot tell the, the story of my government in like two minutes. Maybe two hours is too short for me to do it, clearly. Okay, let's take a look then at this short clip from what you did, yeah? And then we continue talking about it. Here it is. When I first came to China, I was fascinated at the idea of living under a different political system. A system slightly less entertaining, certainly, definitely less loud, and to some observers in the West, less democratic. At least, that's what I first thought. Time now to shed some light on how the Chinese govern themselves. 
and compare it to the more blustery, more blousy cousins in the West. So, after you did the story, did you get some of your questions answered? Do you know, I did actually. I did. I mean, I was really, what I was really interested to find out is why the, the government here, at least externally, is so quiet. I mean, I'm used to the sort of government in the <laughs> okay. West where everyone's shouting, here, here, yeah, all like the time, and they're other. fighting. And then I've got some clips from the Turkish parliament where <laughs> if somebody doesn't agree with somebody else in the Turkish pilot parliament, they hit each other, you know. They've got Not just great in Turkey, really them do. Them many them, places. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, and then you, you, know, you then cut to a picture of the Chinese government, and it's very, very serene and orderly. Did you find out the you know. answers then? Yeah, I did. What I, do you I think? Basically, I yeah. basically found out that... They do have all the punch-ups. Well, maybe, maybe not punch-ups, but they do have all the big debates. They do right. get very, you know, emotional and very involved with things, mm -hmm. but behind closed doors. Mm. And then we were sort of talking about, well, you know, is it a good thing to have, to have government behind closed doors? And, you know, actually, I think it is. Well, basically, you're talking about the decision, the policy-making process, right? What kind of deliberation process is going on in China? We are not deliberating in public as some kind of debate. Uh, a lot of deliberation, a lot of uh, opinion gathering, a lot of uh, um, uh, discussion debates have been taking place before a policy went to print. The way that we do things in the West, where it's, where it's more... Um, transparent if you like but 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 in a way it's not because you might see because you're only seeing edited highlights of a debate so you might see on the evening news 10 seconds of two politicians shouting at each other mm -hmm. and giving neat little sound bites but that's not the same as actually watching the whole debate or going through Hansard which is the political record of and, what's and been basically said and even reading or uh, even the debating itself is not the only thing about uh, policy making I, is not no. the only thing in a policy making process no. I mean you you can't just make up a po policy because two pol politicians or two mm. senators agree yeah. on it right you have to go out on the streets you have to talk to people from different walks of right. life and a lot of that uh, I'm sure is also happening behind the scenes in, in, in any other country mm -hmm. I don't know uh, jo Possibly. Jonathan? Yeah, Jonathan? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the United States, it's the idea is that it's all about transparency and that it's, it's the people's decisions, the people's politicians that are being elected and making the decisions for us. Um, but yeah, it's a, democracy is messy. It's many times transparent, not always. Um, we're seeing it now with the, with the current president, Donald Trump. It's not what a lot of people expected, but it seemed to be what a lot of people wanted. Um, and it's a very different form of government than China. And so it's interesting looking at the comparisons between the two forms of, of government and seeing how it works for different countries and for different cultures. But I think one point uh, which Jonathan made uh, was very important is a system that suits the country, that suits right. the culture of it. And I think that is the problem a lot of people have. Taoyuan, you also lived in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people seem to use one standard to, to try to fit all different yeah. systems. What, what were the experience you had? So I think that's the interesting thing, because I was go going to say that China is such a big country. You know, one standard doesn't even apply mm -hmm. to different parts of China. That's why we're seeing two storylines being developed here. The, the one is development. Um, you guys mm -hmm. have talked about it. And the other is lingering poverty. And those are two very separate storylines, and yet they're intertwined. Because when you talk about poverty, what caused poverty? People talk about left behind children, left behind women, left behind elderly. What caused that phenomenon is young people trying to get out of poverty, trying to move into cities. So urbanization inevitably causes uh, these people who, who can find jobs in the cities to be left behind. Mm -hmm. So they may look like two different things, but it's, it's really, it, Development costs everything because yeah. China, I think w the one word that defines China right now is change, right? No yeah. one. It's such a difficult country to tackle for us as journalists. Right. But you being so young uh, from appearance, <laughs> <laughs> at least, um, Just was, it <laughs> <laughs> was it difficult for you to go there and relate to the story of harshness? Because I, I don't think you, you ever experienced any, anything like, th like right. that in your personal life. Right. And how did you relate to these people and bring out their um, and, and put it in, in pictures and show it to the world? Well, I think the easy answer is that we all have that as journalists, empathy. 
you know, to be able to understand. That's our job, to be able to understand right. different people and talk to them and represent them, whether we do a good job representing them or not, because I don't think we can fully understand another person or another group's life. Um, what we can do, it's just like I said, it's so different to understand China either. So I think what we should do or what we can do is to try our best to get to the truth. I'm not saying we're doing a great job. We're just saying we're trying at least, right? Mm. Let's take a look at Taoyuan's effort then from this short video clip. <laughs> Yang Xiaobing's goats are the few companions he has left in this village. His wife and many of his neighbors have moved out of these remote mountains. Yang decided to stay put, daunted by the high cost of living in towns and his lack of skills. I'm too old for change. I moved down here for a few days and came back. I'm used to my life here. Yang's concerns are slowing down a nationwide relocation plan aimed at lifting China's rural farmers out of poverty. His way of life shows why the drive is necessary. The mountainous Guizhou province is one of the least developed regions. Poverty driving most adults to the city for better jobs, and these are the ones left behind. They now have a choice to move into town settlements like this one for free. Wow, what a what a contrast, yeah. right? And can uh, I just point out that broom yeah. that the old guy was mm -hmm. making? He sells them for five kwai each. That's Which is less than one dollar. That's yeah. about eight U.S. cents. But for him, that's that's income enough. Wow. Yeah. Uh, explain a little bit. Where was this village, and uh, you know, how was this transformation made? All right. So basically, this West China's Guizhou province. That's one of the most backward. Uh, provinces in China and the government right now is trying to take these uh, villagers out of their villages into cities and towns uh, the the buildings why taking them away instead of helping them where they are well for many many reasons because China is um, conducting poverty alleviation efforts in many different ways and relocation I'm sorry to say it's one of the last resorts uh, because some terrain is too harsh for road building so it makes more sense to bring them out than, than building roads because you end up saving some money. They get to move into these houses for free, mm -hmm. but even so, you end up saving money than, than building roads. And urbanization is also a drive for economic growth, so the government would want to see more people ending up in cities and towns. But that also creates problems because these people, they don't want to move out. You see their living condition and you see the kind of houses that they should be able to move into, but yet they don't want to move. Because they have feelings for their old way of life? Or 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 for so yeah. many different, so many different <coughs> and bizarre reasons. So they're used to their village life. Um, they, you know, farmers Is the new village very much far away from where they were living? They're before? all close by townships. Okay. The thing is the traffic is really bad. So from that township you see to that guy's house takes about one hour or two hours drive depending on whether it rains or not. Mm -hmm. And the road is very, very twisting. So besides um, building these new villages, uh, villages and providing the resources for the people to move, the government also have to do the work to persuade them to move. Right? That's the most difficult part the most because yeah. they won't be persuaded. Yeah. This guy, what you don't see in this clip is that it's really funny. His wife actually moved down. Mm. So they're living <laughs> separately right now. So he wants to stay where he, he has been stay. living for He wants a to long stay. Um, he's afraid that he doesn't have any skills, so yeah. he won't be able to find a way to sustain himself mm. in cities and mm. towns. Right. Um, he wants to be he wants to be buried instead of cremated. Mm. And you can only so do the that traditional in, way, right, in yeah. his hometown. <laughs> he he misses his goats. He calls them their fr his friends. But, but in he the new town, <laughs> 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 exactly. yeah. but in the new town, are there not such facilities, uh, for instance, where he can herd his goats, where he can do his traditional crafts? Uh, are there are there such considerations or? Right. Well, yes and no, because it's a town. Why would you want to hurt goats in a town when, when you have the relevant job training and career training? So they have to change their lifestyle. Right. It's, it's a much bigger story than right. just It's actually a whole relocation package. It's yeah. not like I give you a house, yeah. you move down, right. that's it. It's like I give you job training, 
um, and then I find a job for you. I develop industry for wow. you, so you'd be wow. able to work in this um, fruit farm, fruit plantation, or or this factory. So it's a packaged service. Yeah, but to sell that package and, and for the package to be really accepted by the locals is a lot of work. Right. And China has 70 million people right. to be lifted out of poverty over the next few years. Jonathan? <laughs> I, I'm stunned by all of it. I, I found your story so, so, so fascinating. Why? Um, yeah. Because it's unlike anything I've ever seen. Um, to, as you say, a relocation package for people living in poverty who get free housing, job training, um, all of that. Right. It's just, it's a very unique form of government that a lot of countries do not provide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very, very interesting to me. But you, do you, uh, the, I believe there is also the poverty situation in the United States. Mm -hmm. and Absolutely. Uh, would you compare? Have you ever done any? I don't any? think there is any comparison. And the United States definitely had its period where uh, many people were living in poverty um, without access to electricity and running water. And there was big programs, I think as late as the 60s, to try to lift people out of poverty. Um, the approach was very different and um, was not so, honestly, so clear cut. Mm -hmm. I think it was more about uh, more providing better education, provide better training, but I think it relied on the individual taking the initiative to lift themselves out of poverty instead with of government, government help instead of the government coming in yeah. and lay, laying yeah. out a very clear roadmap. Yeah. One thing I, ob I tend to observe is here in China, the responsibility of the government or the accountability of the government is, seems to be much larger than in the West, right? Here the government yeah. is held responsible if these people are not lifted out of poverty, whereas maybe in a, in a Western society it is the government's responsibility as well, but a big part, your personal responsibility if you don't want to work if you you know if you're poor maybe that is your own problem a little bit but also of course in the west every four or five years we go off in a different direction as, as uh, presidents come and go prime ministers come or go policies change round you know you get a government that comes in that that looks after the poor and then the next government yeah cuts resources Take a look at poor. President Obama and also President Trump. So Obama is like a big fan of uh, Obamacare. He, he mm. wants to give everyone this, uh, the health insurance, but starting from the first day um, after President John Trump took the office, that yeah. one was withdrawn mm. completely. So it was a big contrast for different precedents to take place. Yeah, and in China, uh, we do not have that problem because the government is very consistent, very right? Consistent. They don't have the pressure of democracy, right. of, being, of staying in power, of being right. re-elected, so they can plan a little bit longer term okay. and uh, do the necessary say painful there's reforms. there's willpower in China from above, then it gets done. Yeah. Yeah. Things yeah. get done, right? Sure. Yeah. I think that is also the reason why high-speed train infrastructure projects are able to, push, to be pushed through in such efficiency because the government is determined to have that mm -hmm. and they galvanize the will of the, the society. It releases a five-year plan, doesn't it? And then at the end of that five-year plan, it releases another five-year plan, and then another one. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the West, you know... We a five-year term, we a five-year five government, term, maybe two or three-year yeah, government. Yeah, I mean the second one, is spent the whole time is spent reversing what the first <laughs> exactly. one did, you know. Exactly. So we are sort of going like so that right. the whole time. Right, right. It's right. not moving it's forward. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, another big story that uh, Zhou Yun did, mm. which uh, I understand is a very difficult one. It's a very it? serious political one. <laughs> it's a serious political yeah. one, but it also has to do with economics, which is an interview with China's chief uh, negotiator for the uh, WTO accession, right, Mr. Exactly, Long Yong Su, very, very famous. <laughs> Maybe we take a look at this clip first, <laughs> yes. what you did, and then yes. we we'll talk about that. Yeah, here you go. Conference, so agrees. On November the 10th, 2001, a final gavel officially confirmed the WTO's endorsement of China's membership. It was very hard-earned fruit after 15 years of demanding negotiations. We have to know that it takes some time for both China and its negotiation partners to understand the nature of this negotiation. Long Yongtu was a key figure in this process. As the chief negotiator, he's had to always strike a balance between defending the interests of China and making compromises to meet the demands of his counterparts. It's quite difficult to understand and find out a meeting point of interest of both sides. China's accession in 2001 was a watershed moment for the country and the world. The country has become much more integrated with the global economy and has grown steadily to become the world's second largest economy. Despite this, there have been voices of discontent about China's sudden rise, saying it's a free rider of globalization. So what are the untold stories behind the negotiation process 
how the Chinese enterprises face fierce competition from foreign companies, and what's the biggest lesson that China has learned since its WTO obsession. What is the biggest lesson China has learned? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So <laughs> I actually asked him that. And uh, I asked because, uh, as I said, there was this 15 years of uh, very tough negotiation process. And I asked him that w whether he thinks it's worth it. And he said yes. It's a very confirmed yes. Because um, at the beginning in 2001, you know, at, time, at that time, China grows at about 8% or even more. So at that time, there was not 18. only 8%. 8. 8%. 8%. And annual growth. So at that time, there was actually a resistance part of China. They think, no, we don't need to join WTO. We are actually good with this mm -hmm. kind of not so open market. But at that time, he and also some other, um, a lot of Chinese senior uh, politicians, they believed that we must join the world system. We must become this, uh, become part of this integrated world economic landscape. So um, and also at the beginning, we think that you know having a discussion or negotiation like that is more about fighting, right? Because you have to take the request from so many different countries, United States, Europe. Mm -hmm. But after I talked to him, I feel like it's, it's actually also about making compromises. And um, so it's, it's about meeting the interests of different, different parties yeah. and achieve the win-win. That's actually the key idea that we mm -hmm. should be delivered here. Mm -hmm. So the biggest lesson, I think, uh, according to Long Yongtu, is now China is open. Um, it's a, um, it's more importantly, it's a rule-based market. At the beginning, so many people are just scared that once this market is open with the swarm in of the foreign investors, that so many crucial industries will be crushed. But now we do not see this is happening. Yeah. Actually, we see the Chinese companies and so many industries are becoming more resilient. But what about the world? I mean, a lot of people are doubting this. They're saying, yeah. look, China, you have done well. Exactly. You were eight before you joined. Now you are still, <laughs> you know, almost seven, let's yep. say. Mm -hmm. You gained a lot. That's a good example. Mm -hmm. You know, what about the world? In America, a lot of people, you know, jobless. That's what President right. Trump said again. So did, did you ask this kind of question? I asked for him, and I, nobody could deny that the trade or the increase in trade with China could partially contribute to the job loss in the United States, but no one or the majority doesn't believe that that's the key reason. The key reason for the job loss is either the, in, uh, the innovation uh, in the States or it's the automation. So it's not, we should not blame the trade increase for that part of job loss. And the United States, uh, the government itself should be thinking about what they should be helping instead of blaming the others. And also um, because I was in this news event a few days ago and the head of the OECD said that uh, the free trade should not be blamed for job loss, and the backfire neighbor approach should be ended. We should not get back to that. And I mean globalization I is yeah. the trend. I, that's I just for sure. find it impossible mm -hmm. nowadays. How can you not interact with, with other countries? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, uh, for me, that's common sense, right? Yeah. And you're wing rip doing this. Maybe this is made in China. So, <laughs> yeah, I live in the States and you pay like 90% of stuff, like the, the reasonable, with reasonable price and high quality is actually made in China. Everybody takes what they need, right? What, what is best for them and make the best out of it. Exactly. China did that too. We took uh, the jobs. We were the world's factory. Well, we also got the world's pollution. So. Right. Right. We have right. to make sacrifices yeah. as well. Well, I guess um, if we keep on talking, we cannot still have so many interesting stories, but fascinating journeys you have gone through, and I hope uh, this journey will continue in the near future. And uh, with that, we're going to wrap up this special edition of The Point with me, Lushin. I hope you enjoyed it. And as, you, as usual, you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook using the handle The Point with Alex. Download the application called CGTN Live or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thank you very much for joining us and see you next time on CGTN.